Today's episode of This Week in Venture Capital is brought to you by Fenwick and West and Assistly. Go to assistly.com slash VC for your special offer. Tune in this week to This Week in Venture Capital. Learn all about how to drive traffic to your website with one of the foremost experts on the topic, Rand Fishkin. Tune in. There is no stopping an idea whose time has come. But the best entrepreneurs don't stand still with an idea. They get to the business of getting things done. So step forward with your idea. And when you're ready, sit down and tell me how you want to change the world. This Week in Venture Capital. Welcome to This Week in Venture Capital. We're going to do a Skype edition today, but I'm excited because our guest is a guy that I'm actually a really big fan of. It's Rand Fishkin, and he runs a company called SEO Moz, although I'm going to ask him about his branding today of SEO Moz. And I'm joined by Mike Procco, who uh, works here at, well, you work at Mahalo, or you work at This Weekend, or a bit Mahalo, of both? Or do you work bit, for Squarespace? Or? A little, I, I think so. I get the t-shirt on all the time. But uh, no, I work for Mahalo, working on a new site, askfordeal.com. Um, and also doing some videos for Mahalo, just at an iOS 5 series today. So And askforadeal.com is a Mahalo-owned property? Correct. It's a new web property of Mahalo.com. So. And, and what are you doing on that? Uh, managing product. So okay. working with the design team here and the developers to uh, build out the product. So Awesome. And do we have Rand? Are you there? I'm here. How's it going, Mark? Good. How's the weather up there in Seattle? It's uh, not nearly as nice as California, I suspect. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining. Uh, happy to see you over Skype. Um, look, why don't we get kicked off? What I would love to do is start before we get what I'd like to do is go through your background a bit. You have a very sure. atypical story. It was, um, you know, really only about three years ago that you wanted to raise VC and couldn't. And it seems like you're kind of beating people off with a stick these days <laughs> as, as, you're, as you're becoming a very real business. And I want to get into that. Um, and, and then in the second half, I'd like to get some advice out of you on how to drive traffic, both SEO and social. Let's go back to your life story. How did you get started with SEO Moz? Yeah, so in 2001, I dropped out of school uh, I was at the University of Washington and joined my mom's company, which is a, a weird founder story. Like you hear, you know, brothers, you hear father and son, you rarely hear uh, mother and son. And so my mom had been running a traditional marketing agency for a long time, a very small one. I joined up, we started doing web design development uh, and we contracted out our SEO, but we had varying degrees of failure uh, with contracting that out. And so we brought it in house Learn that, I started the SEO Moz blog with the idea of combining SEO with, with transparency uh, and openness, which is where the Moz name comes from, sort of Mozilla Foundation, Chef Moz, DMoz, all that. And Moz was born as just a, an informational site for the first couple of years and then became very popular and we changed the business to being an SEO consulting business, grew that for a few years. Uh, and. Although we had some, some nasty years in there where we went deep into debt, we were eventually able to pay that off uh, and grow that company. And then we got into uh, the software Time out, field. time out, time out, time out. Uh, I'm going to make you be a good interviewee. Uh, if you okay. were in uh, the studio, I would have cut you off five times already. Uh, the only reason is I just don't want to gloss over some things that seem a little bit glossy. So yeah. when you started the website part of it, why did you do that? What did you think you were actually building? Did you do it just to put knowledge out? Did you think that would be a great way to help your consulting business? Um, were you yeah. looking just to get input on from other people on your uh, knowledge of SEO? It's sort of interesting. I think there was a, I'd love to say that it was entirely um, you know, driven by my desire to share and, and do good things in the industry. But to be totally honest, I think uh, I have to admit that I was excited by the possibility of building a brand, you know, at that time. And and I think that, to be quite honest, it was a uh, hey, there's about you know four or five big bloggers in the search SEO marketing space, 
and I feel like I could do something like that. I want to start sharing what I'm doing. Uh, and so the blog started you know, very, very simply. You go back to the first posts, and it's like, wow, did you know that links matter for SEO? You know, it's, it's pretty uh, That's <laughs> profound. basic beginner level stuff. <laughs> Excellent. But, and and uh, you said there were three or four other blogs on the topic. Did yeah. you think about, because this is something I thought a lot about as a blogger, uh, did you think about how you were going to differentiate on your blog and how you were going to stand out relative to the other people? Yeah, one of the big things, I mean, is this whole idea of Moz and transparency. So a lot of the, a lot of the SEO world, not, not necessarily just the blogs, but the forums and conferences, a lot of it is, trust me, I've done the testing, I know this stuff, and uh, oh, and there's a few secret things that I can't tell you about how SEO works because you know that's my secret sauce and, and I'm gonna protect those secrets. That's just not, not how I wanted the field to be. You know, I felt that uh, being open about everything that we did, being open about how our clients were doing, being open about the tests that we perform, about the tools that we use, the metrics that we saw, the techniques we saw working, was the way to go, and that's gotten us into trouble at times when we sort of, you know, broadcast a message, and I don't know, somebody at Google doesn't like that, or it's gotten us positive things when we've found new signals before anybody else and written about them uh, sort of very early on. So it carries risk, but also carries reward. And back then, you were still targeting, if I'm not mistaking, driving your consulting business, yeah? Primarily, I mean. What's interesting is before the consulting business even existed, we were doing web design and development, and the SEO Moz blog was more a, let me see if I can build a brand in this SEO space, as well as let me see if I can get feedback on the ideas uh, that I'm putting out there. Because yeah, I, I, very frankly, when I started the site, I knew very little about SEO. And through which years was it mostly a consulting business? And I know you and I spent time in person talking about this transition from consulting yeah. to product, which is something that's very hard to do, and I commend you for your success there. Um, when did you realize you shouldn't be a consulting business and you should be a product business? When did you pivot? And I know you're very transparent with revenues, so I will ask you. I ordinarily sure. don't like to uh, ask people that. Uh, how big was your company at the time, and how did you finance yourself to that point? <laughs> so the financing to that point is the is the most hilarious part. But uh, so in 2003, we were still a design development company. I think it was 2005 that we switched to being an SEO consulting company and changed the name to SEO Moz. Uh, at that time, in 2005, when we made that switch, we had gosh a ton of debt, personal debt. So you know, you remember before 2008, it was super easy to get credit cards, personal loans, equipment loans, and we hadn't gone for any venture or institutional financing. I don't, I don't think we even really knew what that was. I had no idea what the, the startup world was, to be quite honest with you. you know, we were protected in our, in our little backwoods of the east side of Seattle. And so we had, at one point, we had about maybe $150,000 in personal debt between my mom and I, and uh, we were, in 2003, 2004, we were unable to make our minimum payments at one point, and so that debt load quickly ballooned into about half a million dollars uh, over the next couple of years. And it was only over the following few years as the consulting business, the SEO consulting business got better, that we managed to pay it off. So there were some ugly, nasty, horrible years. I mean, Mark, there were days where like debt collectors would come to the office and ask for me. I mean, just... <laughs> terrible days. But so. that's why I love spending time with you because it's fun to meet entrepreneurs who have been through that time in the market. <laughs> yeah. I literally had Vinny the leg breaker come in to see me and wondering why I wasn't making payments. I mean, okay, his name wasn't that, but it might as well have been. Those are <laughs> yeah. fun days, yeah. right? Like oh, I, I have so sure. many stories ran from those days that I've been reluctant to write about in my blog posts because I want to write a book next year and I want to put some of the craziest stories, and I'm talking crazy, like middle of the night, moving computers out of a building, uh, past the security man, uh, into new offices because the guy wouldn't let me out of my rent, those kind of stories. But that's kind I, I of what life felt exactly like for you, that right? Story. 
Say again? I have exactly that story. We were in an office in tower in Bellevue and we couldn't pay our rent anymore and we had to, on the weekend, sneak in. I actually snuck in with some of my friends and we moved it all through the freight elevator and my mom had like surreptitiously gotten the freight elevator key on Friday and forgotten to give it back and it, it was hilarious. So now, I know exactly what you're talking about. Remind me, your mom's name is Jillian or something like Jillian, that? Jillian, yeah. And But you don't call her mom, you call her Jillian. What, what's the story with that? Well, I mean, you know, particularly for the last, uh, what is that, 10 years now, it's weird to say, oh yeah, I'll have my mom bill you for that. <laughs> you know, like that doesn't, that doesn't work so well. Uh, and to be fair, you know, I think Jillian was obviously, you know, co-founder, was very active in the business until about 2007, 2008. The last uh, three years has been sort of doing evangelism for us. And so we, we work, uh, you know, we still work together. She's on the board of directors here, but she's sort of not active in the day-to-day -day operations. Anymore. Okay, but on Thanksgiving, is she mom or is she Jillian? Thanksgiving mom. Okay. And uh, VCs weren't exactly beating down your door when you wanted to raise money. Talk a little bit about that experience and why it frustrated you. And again, I know you've written about this publicly, so I assume yeah. you're okay to kind of talk through that. Sure, sure. So basically, um, I'll give you a, a tiny bit of backstory. So it's 2007. Uh, and we had just finished kind of paying off the worst of our debts. And, and I don't mean we paid off half a million dollars in debt. I mean, we'd call up a, you know, Chase Manhattan and say, hey, guys, we know we owe you 30 grand. Can we give you $7,000? And they would, of course, take that deal because selling it to a debt collector, you know, you get 10 cents on the dollar or less. Uh, so we had paid back most of that by 2007. And in at the beginning of 2007, we launched this software product that was essentially the private tools we had built for our own SEO consulting purposes. And we decided, hey, let's carry this Moz thing and transparency one step further, let people subscribe for $29 a month via PayPal uh, to access our tools and our software behind the, the veil and got a lot of subscribers. We did, so we, that year we did about 800,000 in revenue total and it was about 50-50 consulting and software. At the end of the year, Ignition Partners uh, over here in Seattle was like, man, you know, you SEO Moz guys look really interesting. Seems like an exciting business. Do you want to take some money? And they pitched us on taking a million dollars. So we raised uh, $1.1 million from them in Curious Office, which is a small private investing firm here in Seattle. And we used that money to kind of grow out our, uh, our tools. One of the big things we wanted to do was build a link graph like Google so that we could show who's linking everyone, build our own version of PageRank, our own version of TrustRank. Uh, and let people see behind that veil of the, the web's link graph. So we did that, uh, launched that in 2008. The business did 1.4 million that year, of which about a million was consulting, 1.1 million was consulting, or 1.1 million was software, sorry, and 300,000 was consulting. And then 2009, uh, we, had, we were on track for a $4 million a year, and I went out to try and raise venture capital uh, on the advice of some friends in Silicon Valley that, you know, you've got, a, you've got a real business on your hands. You should try and, you know, pour the gas on the fire, the old saying goes. And uh, that sucked. Oh, my God, did that suck. And no offense to, you know, people in your profession, Mark, <laughs> but, oh, man, you guys can make life miserable for entrepreneurs Tell for me, a long what, time. What was, what was the worst of it, either the worst story, and you don't have to name names, or the worst experience, and what did you learn through that process, either about the process or about your business? Uh, so one of the big things we learned about our business, I would say, is that, well, a couple of things. One is uh, detailed metrics, keeping track of very detailed metrics uh, internally has been extremely helpful for us. And I think that process did help us to focus on that even more than we had been in the past. We'd been moderately rigorous, now we're exceptionally rigorous with that. Uh, and that's certainly been helpful. But the other thing I learned about the process was two things. Number one, it's a lot better to raise money when people come to you first, right? If you can uh, essentially wait until investors are trying to sell you on taking money, that's just gonna make that process so much better than trying to sell them on, on raising. And the second thing is, I think we went about a ton of things wrong. So, I'll, you know, one of the things that we did is is made the funnel huge. We talked to forty 
uh, different investors from all ranges of, uh, of companies in Boston, in New York, in the Valley, most of them in the Valley, but uh, a few from other geographies. And one of the most frustrating things was that we didn't get a no. We always got a, we're still interested, keep us up to date, let's have another meeting, let's have another call, can you send us more data, how are you doing this month? And so that process turned from, okay, let's try and get something done in 60 days to, all right, four or five months later, we gotta shut this thing down because it's just killing us, it's killing the team's productivity, killing the business growth. Um, that, was, that was the worst of the pain, was the, the people who went from first phone call not to a no, but to a let's meet, let's meet again, let's meet with more partners, let's pull in some associates, can you get on the phone with these other entrepreneurs, we wanna talk to some of your customers, can you pull these new metrics for us? Ugh. Killed us. Gotcha. Um, Rand, I wanna do a very small aside before uh, I get to my next line of questioning. And in fact, I wanna know how you went about turning that into a product business. But I wanna talk about Assistly. So what Assistly does, they're a sponsor of the show. They help businesses manage customer service. And here's what I mean. The old world was you have a complaint about a company, you pick up the phone, you call someone, you complain. And in that world, they, we had, and because I was an ex-software developer, we had systems called trouble tickets, trouble ticketing systems. Places like Remedy uh, was one of the uh, major players. And um, that was fine, right? Because you had one channel coming into your company. Then all of a sudden you have IM companies, instant messaging companies that would say, hey, would you like to talk to someone live? Now suddenly you had to figure out how are you gonna staff phone calls coming in and the IM. And then there was a click to talk to a rep, right? And then suddenly it was, oh, now I have to have um, a, a customer service email address. And then that was, and, and you could see that the customer support, support systems were starting to burst a little bit at the seam. And then everything changed, and it changed with social because suddenly I have a Facebook fan page, let's call it that. I don't know what the F they call it anymore, but what we used to call Facebook fan pages. Now people can write anything they want, and they can write, I don't like your product, right? And you got to respond to that. But even more so, Twitter has become this great ground of people being wanting to say I had this terrible experience and um, you know we know places like Comcast um, have invested heavily in trying to listen to what's going on there and respond to people so in this world of call it multi-channel complaints or product feedback to my company and then I have to farm that out to multiple people and I may get a call and respond on Twitter or get a tweet and respond on a call, you need a system that helps you manage all that. And that's what Assistly does. Uh, the reason I know it so well, um, it's not that I have it all in a script. The script actually is not very informative. In fact, the script says Assistly is used by 37 Signals, Pandora, and Yelp and can help you too. Oh, and by the way, you can get 15% discount and you get one free seat at www.assistly.com forward slash VC. So I've done that bit, I always forget to do that. But the reason I know the company so well is I absolutely love the founding team. I know Alex Bard, the CEO, very well. Uh, so I was delighted when they agreed to sponsor the show because I want companies like this that I can speak about authentically. We worked with Alex at one of his previous companies which was called eAssist. This is his fourth company three of which, he and his founder, three of which have been in customer service. So what they've built is something that's imminently usable for you as a startup company or a bigger company. But that's enough of this ad. Rand, tell us, I, I've said publicly it's really hard to take a services business and make it into a product business. How did you do it? Uh, iteratively, slowly, uh, and a little bit painfully, but one of the, I would say one of the biggest things that we found as a services business is that we weren't just a consulting company, we also had a big sort of media outlet, right? The, the blog was extremely popular. I mean, at the time, I say extremely popular, it had 10,000 
subscribers, maybe 20,000 subscribers. Now it has 95,000 uh, RSS subscribers, and we had maybe 10,000 visits a day, and now we're up to like 50,000. But this is in 2007, and we sort of had a marketable audience who listened to us, who, who felt that we were an authoritative source. And so one of the things that I'd say for anyone who's considering I'm, I want to go from services into product is, can you build thought leadership? Can you build you know, authentic uh, content around the problem that you're going to help solve? Can people view you as an expert? And can that be distributed, not just among the 20 or 30 or 100 companies you consult with, but in the wider web world? Because that's going to be a huge market that you can iteratively test on, that you can ask them, you know, what do you want? You can do product development. And it was painful for us. I, Mark, I'll, I'll be quite honest, like our, our uh, Ignition board member, Michelle Goldberg, was like, Rand, you're, you're, you're going into this product space, but you keep refusing to hire a VP or director to run product. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that should be me. I should be the person running product. I'm building the product for people like me, for SEO consultants or, and in-house SEOs. And, and she's, all right, you, you'll come around. You'll come around to the to this idea. And eventually I did, and we hired a formal VP of product, and he's running a team now, and that's kicked way more ass than I could have on my own. But it's a learning process. Now, I have to go to user questions because um, Ryan Schilling has asked two times different questions back to an old topic, which is about debt. How did you get through the darkest days of having $500,000 of debt? How far would you have gone before you said, this just isn't working, I got to do something else? So a normal, rational human being would have given up, I think, uh, a couple years before we were able to get over that hill. But And I'd love to tell you it was just oh, we believe so much in this, we're gonna to stick to our guns, we can make it through anything. Uh, the real truth of the matter is, um, so my, my, my parents are married, you know, have been married my, my whole life, still are, and my dad, we never told my dad that we had any debt. So <laughs> we were kind of in this situation where if we went bankrupt and like, you know, tried to get out of it that way, he would find out. And so it was this, like, well, shit, like what can we, really, what can we do? We, we have to make a success of this. Like our backs are against a wall from a family perspective, from a personal perspective, from a financial perspective, from every kind of way. And I, you know, I wasn't taking home a paycheck. My, my wife, then, who was then my girlfriend, whom you've met, uh, Geraldine, was, was paying all my bills, was paying my rent, my food, everything. So it was ugly and nasty, but it was just that we had no choice. Like that's, that's what kept us going. Would there have been a point where you would have, the debt would have gotten so big that you, well, I guess it's a hypothetical. Yeah, I, I'd like to think that, you know, at some point it just would have become overwhelming, but but I don't know. I mean, we, we played it so far, you know, it was ridiculous. Like to have debt collectors coming and essentially like to try and disassociate myself from having any home address, because I lived with my girlfriend, so you couldn't actually track me down, um, it was weird. So um, how much did you start charging for your products? How did you decide if you wanted to go for small and mid-sized businesses, so-called SMBs versus yeah. big corporates? How did that whole process work? Yeah, so we, we really optimized toward uh, let's find people for whom the tools that we built work. That was the, the thing that we did initially because we, we basically already had the um, the tools and the software built out for our own consumption. And so he said, let's find more people like us, which of course many of them were already reading and consuming SEO Moz on a regular basis uh, through our blog. And then over time, we've done more sophisticated types of, of product and customer development, sort of at, uh, trying to survey the industry and find out who's out there and what the big problems they have are, what metrics they care about and are trying to track. Uh, putting those in there. In terms of pricing, I think we were pretty unsophisticated. So we started at $29 a month, which we figured was something everyone could afford. Uh, and then slowly we've been growing that over time as we've seen uh, a few interesting things. So one is if you raise the price of your subscription, but you grandfather in the people who are there, 
uh, your retention rate for the people who are grandfathered in stays quite excellent. And the higher price doesn't actually have a barrier to entry, at least not at the prices that we've seen. So we went from 29 to 39 to 49, then 79, and now 99 uh, a month is sort of the low priced uh, entry level point. And so that's been a bit of experimentation, not extremely scientific. I think, the, to be fair, the team's gotten a lot more rigorous about that in terms of uh, testing things out, trying new price points, using AdWords and other forms. But, you know. Good. Let's start to talk about SEO itself. Now, SEO, uh, f I, I think everyone watching the show would know, but I just sometimes like to be clear, uh, stands for search engine optimization. When you think about a SERP, which is a search engine results page, that's what they call them, SERPs, right? You got it. Uh, when you talk about a SERP, you have organic search, which is the bit that's not paid for. At least you don't pay Google or Yahoo or whatever Google or Bing for it. Um, and then there's the SEM, which is search engine uh, marketing, which is paid. Yeah. Um, do you, first of all, do you just help people with that SEO, that organic bit, or do you help people with both? No, uh, we are. We're focused on the organic side only, and not just of SEO, but of social and content and local and all that stuff. So now, if, if there's traffic that you get that you don't pay for, we try to help with that. Now, it's a misnomer to say that SEO is free, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Well, if you mean you don't have to pay for every visit, that is accurate. But if you mean it costs you no time, energy, or effort, that would be utterly false. Um, I think often it costs actual dollars. It's just soft dollars because often it's people in your office that are either being paid to write articles, being paid to design software that um, helps you better with SEO, being paid to do biz dev deals that create inbound links. Like all these things that drive you in organic, uh, there's a real cost associated with that. It may not be the same cost as SEM, but yeah. it's not bagel, right? Yeah, I think that you could think about it like community management or you know, what does it cost you to run a good Twitter account? What does it cost you to run a good Facebook fan page? What does it cost you to have uh, a great you know, blog? It costs time and energy and effort and, and those things are things that some founders are great at. Sometimes they need to uh, outsource that. Sometimes they want to bring that in-house and have sort of a you know, almost an inbound marketing team or a director of inbound marketing, that kind of thing on their staff. Sometimes you get that team scaled out so much that you actually have, all right, this person runs, this is my VP of marketing, and then I have people who do content, I have people who do social, I have people who do SEO specifically. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of that in the marketplace so happening now. Mike Belcito is asking in the chat room, for startups that aren't experts at SEO, how can we utilize Crap, it just scrolled. <laughs> it scrolled off my screen. Give me one second. Okay, here we go. How can we utilize SEO without trusting a crazy budget with some agency? I think what he means is, uh, do you have to bring in outside help or are there some simple 101 type tools that aren't that expensive to get you a boost? Yeah, that, th there's two things I would do. Number one, uh, do a Google search for SEO guide. You'll find a couple of good ones. One's from Google, one's from SEO Moz, but it's free. Uh, and those, if, if you just read those and you understand the basics of that, you'll, you'll kind of get this idea like, wow, if I can just make my content crawlable, have really good stuff on my site, have some incentive for people to link to me, uh, get some good social signals in, and use the keywords that people use to search for the products I'm offering, I can get a great return on my SEO efforts very, very easily. That that return is almost always uh, very high, even in the early stages of a startup's life. The problem gets to be when people worry about, like, I need to rank number one for this specific keyword, and I'm just not able to move the needle from page two or page three, and, you know, how do I do that? I, I need to, clearly need to pull in some help. And I'd say that's the, that's the really tough part of SEO, the highly competitive, you know, I'm in travel search and I want to rank number one for cheap flights. 
uh, that's going to be super hard. But hey, if you're uh, Adioso or your kayak or your hip monk, and you can do, you know, the long tail. You can target some different keywords. You can just run an exciting, interesting blog. You can have uh, great video and image content. Like that's going to pull in a lot of great SEO value uh, if you just make those accessible in the right ways. Now, uh, describe for people who are less familiar with the topic of SEO what black hat SEO <laughs> is and white hat, and which are you? Yeah, well, so we are extremely white hat um, for a number of reasons, but one of the biggest ones is that uh, I'm personally of the belief that in the long term... De describe white... what they are so, so people sure, understand. Sure. It may not be a term everybody knows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Think of Black Hat as manipulating the search engines in violation of their guidelines or the intent of their guidelines. And their guidelines follow some very logical paths like, oh, I shouldn't just put a bunch of keywords on a page in white on white text that humans can't read, but search engines are supposed to. And oh, I probably shouldn't uh, go out and you know, find uh, you know, a link a text link advertiser and buy 500 links that come from a bunch of spammy sites and point them to my site to inflate my link popularity, my page rank. Uh, oh, and I probably shouldn't have a page that I show to search engines, but then when an actual human visitor gets there, I redirect them to this other page. You know, those are all black hat kinds of things, stuff where you're manipulating what the engines would like things to do. Uh, white hat is I go out and do good, honest marketing. I have good content. I get good people to link to it. Uh, I'm not paying or manipulating them. They're linking to it because they like it and they authentically endorse it. You know, if I link to bothsidesofthetable.com from SEO Moz, chances are both sides of the table will rank a little bit better. And and I wouldn't do that because you know you're going to hand me ten bucks. I do it because I like the stuff that you publish, uh, and I found you some way. So those organic, natural things are white hat and the manipulative uh, sort of paid or, or uh, violations of terms of use, guideline stuff, that's black hat. Now, there's a good question I saw coming in, which was uh, from eBelity, E-B-E-L-L-I-T-Y. Uh, does it often, oh, fucking hell. It's, every time I go to go, read this, the freaking thing scrolls on me. I got it. Does it often happen that a good advice for SEO is bad advice for the product? Stop scrolling the goddamn screen. Uh, does it often happen that a good advice for SEO is bad advice for the product, like having to design a product differently in a way that sucks a bit just so you can improve SEO? That, yeah, so I'm... I'm going to write a blog post all about this because this is a, a terrible, terrible myth. There is virtually nothing that you can do that will improve your product and make it better and make that experience better that hurts SEO. And likewise, some of the best things that you can do for SEO are to make your product better, your landing pages better, to make them convert higher, to make the user experience more beautiful, more engaging, more useful. Uh, this. I don't know where this myth came from. I think it, you know, it came out of like the late '90s when people would have to keyword stuff uh, to rank well in Lycos and Alta Vista and Hotbot and Infoseek. In the age of Google, like the past 10 years, there are almost no places where you need to worry about the the uh, essentially the trade-off between conversion rate optimization or user happiness and SEO. If if you're getting that advice, it's because Either people aren't creative enough to come up with a good solution, or they don't know what SEO is or don't know what CRO is. So that's that's crazy. So Rand, one of the questions I'm getting from Chris Off, or Chris OPF, uh, or maybe Christoph who forgot a T. I'm not sure. Um, viewers likely interested in Rand's thoughts on why a search for the same search term on Google but in different browsers. Chrome, Firefox, IE, return different results. So is that true? Does that actually happen? And if so, why? Uh, so there's a few reasons why it can happen. It's not actually dependent on the browser itself. But one of the things is, uh, so Chrome might pass location data 
You might be logged in in one of those browsers to Google and you're getting personalized search results or location bias search results versus location agnostic, geographic agnostic results. Uh, there could be social services that you're logged into. So I'm logged into Twitter, so therefore I'm going to see annotated things in my Google search results like this person I'm connected to on Twitter shared this, and so Google's showing me that in a higher ranking result. So there's, there's all sorts of personalization, socialization, localization that Google does, Bing does it too, and that might change from browser to browser depending on whether you're logged in and where you are. Okay, that's uh, very helpful. Um, the, I'm getting a question also from By Jess. By Jess is one of the best infographics people that I know. Awesome. Um, and he wants to know if it's con con considered black hat, white hat, or gray hat to do infographics that have embeds in them. Oh my God, that is. That's super white hat. Like, uh, so it, it, the, the way you think about it is an infographic is this useful, wonderful piece of content that other people want to consume. And an embed link essentially allows anyone to share that on their website easily uh, for free. I think that's a great thing to do for the web because it means that you know, other people who want to show off that graphic can do it. And it's the proper thing to do from an attribution standpoint because it lets uh, not just Google, but all the viewers of that site know where the original infographic came from and who produced it. So that's like one of the most white hat things you can do. So Rand, that I'm getting said, another question. And I have said, to, oh, sorry. Uh, so I, uh, I'm just gonna go real quick on the infographic thing. You can abuse it. Just like anything else in SEO, you can abuse it. So for example, let's say that uh, you have an infographic and you control like the JavaScript of the embed and you change it from pointing back to the site that you know, launch the infographic to, oh, let's have these thousand links on all these other sites that point back for our infographic page, point to paydayloans.info, right? With the anchor text payday loans. That's totally black hat. Like, you know, but you just gotta be, you gotta be careful. Infographics alone aren't bad, but there's ways to manipulate virtually anything. Okay, so you don't wanna be Voldemort, you wanna be more Harry Potter. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Jay Dunk. J-D-U-N-C-K says, I haven't read SEO Moz much before, but I'm really impressed with Rand. Does he have a best of for SEO Moz? If not, he should, such as Joel and Software has the top 10, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Do you have a best of, or do you have a book? Are you coming yeah. out with a book? Are you going on tour? <laughs> no tour, no tour. Uh, I did co-author a book last year with O'Reilly called The Art of SEO. It's reasonably good. Uh, I, I might suggest that. I would say that if you want to check out like the most popular and cool stuff from the blog, on the right side of the blog, there's a most popular posts, and that's just stuff that people like the most, so they've given the thumbs up to it the most times, and that has good stuff in there. So that's a, that's a good way to get that top list. I want to drag Mike in here. You work at Mahalo. Yeah. Mahalo is a company that's pretty dependent upon SEO and being good at SEO. What have you guys learned from the experience? What what challenges have you had? Yeah, I mean, we've kind of pivoted as a company um, from what we do, we're doing to what we're doing now, but uh, we've certainly used SEO Moz, we use the pay product, um, and, and certainly SEO is a large part of what we do um, to get our content out there. I mean, certainly you can produce great content, but you, know, you still have to do the right things from a technical standpoint to make sure that it's getting ranked and people are finding it, so. Um, yeah, I but think yeah. Mike, oh. oh, I was gonna say, Mike makes a great point about, about like great content versus good content. And you hear all the time like people say, oh, you need good, unique content to do well in SEO. But what you really need is content that's so uniquely awesome and amazing that everyone you know who sees it wants to share it. If you get that, you, have, you really have a great SEO strategy. And so let me ask both of you guys this. I've heard that one of the great untalked about stories of Google that never gets said publicly is that if the way that you monetize is through SEM on your site, so not AdWords, but AdSense, if you monetize, and if you don't put competitive products on your site and you have enough volume and a close relationship with Google, you rank higher in SEO if you're a big company. Um, whereas if you have competitive ad products, you might not rank quite as high as you would in a white hat world, as in, 
if you're demand media or mahalo and you put your eggs in the google ad basket and send them a lot of checks uh the page rank gods are nice to you is that <laughs> is there any truth to that i've heard it multiple times i don't know i'm gonna let you go first mike yeah i mean uh Without commenting too much, I mean, I think even if you look at the most profitable AdSense What do you uh, mean without commenting too much? But like, if, if, if you look at the most pop, pop, uh, profitable uh, AdSense publishers, it's still only a small fraction of Google's revenue. And I, I don't think they would ever sacrifice their integrity or their results for such a small portion of their revenue. I mean, that's just my thoughts, but... Yeah. Uh, so, Mark, there's actually some... Uh, mathematical ways to determine whether this is true or not. And so what we do here at SEOMA is one of the things we do on the research front is to uh, get a very large number of Google search results and then run correlation analyses between various features. One of the features that we checked in the last round that we looked at, which was uh, just a couple months ago, was does having Google AdSense on the page help you on average like rank higher? Does it Does it correlate with better rankings? And in fact, the opposite is true. If you have AdSense on your pages, you tend to rank worse than people who don't. The more AdSense blocks you have, the worse you tend to rank. And the higher the pixel count of your AdSense blocks, the worse you rank. So Google sure, on the data side, I'd say Google looks pretty squeaky clean on that. That's uh, unbelievably yeah. helpful to know. So um, I'm Everyone keeps asking about Panda. I promise, guys, I am going to ask about Panda. Um, but I first want to ask about SEO versus SEM. Why don't you focus on SEM as a product? When you were doing consulting or if you're privately advising people, how do you balance what should be SEO and SEM? So I'll go first to Rand, and then I want to know from Mike if you guys do any SEM. Yeah, so... SEM is a good thing to do. It, it, if you can you know, make the, the numbers work and you can earn a positive ROI, you should be doing it. That said, I, I don't like to do it. Like it's not, it, it's not a world that I care about because it's um, sort of paying for a very, very small incremental ROI most of the time because the, the, the results are getting saturated. Like people spend, what, $30 billion a year on, on paid search in the US alone. And yet they spend about $2 billion on all the things that go into organic search. But look at the results. I mean, Google themselves says that uh, less than 25% of all clicks take place on the paid ads and more than 75% take place on the organic side. So what kind of crazy person thinks to themselves, oh, I know, let's go optimize and, and spend all our money and put our eggs in the basket where there's... Uh, the high market saturation, low potential ROI versus this other basket where if we're creative and on the cutting edge, we can earn outsized returns. That's nuts to me. Yeah. Do you guys do it at all? No, I mean, we've, I mean, Mahalo's done it here and there in little bits, but we don't uh, in a significant way do it. Um, and we've, do, we've done more on the social side, you know, paying for stuff on Facebook and some stuff on YouTube, but it's not a significant portion of, of anything we're spending. So I'll mildly contradict you guys and I'll say, and it's only mildly, you should do SEM. You should do SEM. You should do SEM in a case where you have a very clear LTV, yes, lifetime absolutely. value of a customer. And here's what I mean. If I know that on average I make $38 in profit over let's call it a five month period of time, uh, from acquiring a customer, what I actually want to do is increase my spend in marketing, not decrease it, and not rely solely upon SEO. Because SEM, even though it converts at lower percentages, the overall numbers that you see, um, the, the law of large numbers means you get a tremendous amount of clicks. And if you can calculate how much you pay to drive traffic, and the conversion rate of how many convert when they come to your site, you can calculate your actual cost of acquisition. And if I can acquire someone for $18 on average, let's say I spend $1.80 for a, for a click and I convert it 10% to my paid product, mm -hmm. so an $18 acquisition cost per customer, and I know that I make 38 in profit in five months, 
um, I ought to be spending more, not less. So I would only say it depends. Content businesses are notoriously hard to spend on SEM because yeah. uh, on the one side you're spending to get traffic, on the other side you struggle to monetize enough to have paid for that. Yeah, Is so that I'll, fair, I'll, you know, I'll be very transparent with our numbers, for example. So we get uh, about 100 new people taking a free trial a day. Approximately 20 of those are people we paid for. About 10 of those uh, come through Google AdWords. Um, and we pay you know, cost per click rates of between a dollar and ten dollars to acquire those people. And we know we earn a positive ROI because our customer lifetime uh, value on an average member is in the thousand to twelve hundred dollar range because most people, you know, the average person stays on SEO Moz for like twelve months after a free trial. So like those metrics, once you can calculate them internally, you know how much you can spend. So for example, we, we might be willing to spend up to you know, four, five, six hundred dollars to acquire a new customer, knowing that we'll on average make you know over a thousand dollars from them. So the real John Merch, not the fake John Merch, but the real John Merch, would like to know, and so would someone else. I'm just see if I can find him. Uh, Sub Subu Four S U B B U Four would like to know what you think of Trada. Do you have an opinion yeah. on Trada? And if you do, just do. I mean, I know the company. Uh, I met Neil when I was last in Boulder. Can you give a brief description and what you think of him? Yeah, so I mean, Trotta's basic uh, value proposition is that they're going to, you give them your uh, paid search campaign and they have all these, almost like a user generated uh, system where experts will try and optimize your campaign for you via Trotta's interface uh, and then you'll get the return from that but you pay those experts some uh, small percentage of the fee. I, I think it's a cool model, but it's, um, it definitely shows you the, the painfulness of the, uh, of the paid search space, right? That essentially, like, that, that model is so well-tuned, well-oiled at this point, that earning outsized returns from investments in paid searches is, is rare, rare indeed. Uh, so, versus, versus SEO, where it's just, it's still the Wild West. So I'm going to have Neil come on the show and talk about Trotta. Uh, when I met with him and he walked through the business, I have to say uh, the numbers, facts, figures that he shared with me, it was a very compelling story, but I don't oh, want to yeah. try to defend his company himself. I'm just going to have him come on the show. He's a very And impressive. I don't mean to criticize him. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to criticize I'm not, paid search as an outsized return. I'm not suggesting you are. I just think for me, I don't want to jump into the debate. I'm just going to have him come here. Uh, I'm just talking about why I didn't answer personally the question. Uh, by Jess would like to know how important is on-site SEO versus off-site SEO? By Jess says something, but it just scrolled again. Uh, I, I'm going to throw this <laughs> chat room out the door. It keeps scrolling. There's so a, the there's on, a question the on page there versus off page. Uh, basically, the story is on page is something you have to get the the eighty percent of the good stuff that you should be doing on the page right. You know, getting keywords in your title tag, making sure your content's accessible to search engines, having nice friendly URLs that uh, anyone can crawl and that are easy to link to, and that kind of stuff. Uh, the the other twenty percent of like tweaking and tuning and perfecting, like getting every last ounce of on page optimization perfect is probably gonna help you very little most of the time. Off page, uh, you know, getting one more link, two more links, three more links could indeed boost up your rankings. Uh, and now, of course, social is having an influence both directly and indirectly on, uh, on your rankings. And so those off page signals are very powerful too. Good, uh, so my last question before Panda. I feel like I have to drag out this panda so everyone stays with the show, right? It's my <laughs> teaser at the end. Um, tell me what SEO Moz as a product does today. Why should people sign up? How much does it cost? What do they get? Uh, so you should sign up if you are, if you consider yourself sort of intermediate SEO level or above. Like if you're intermediate, advanced, or expert, most of the work that you're doing is probably hard to scale because it takes a bunch of uh, analyses that are wasting tons of your time, and you should probably sign up for SEO Moz. If you are beginner level or below that, you should use SEO Moz's free resources to learn how to do SEO. I mean, the, here's what it, the product does in a nutshell. 
It crawls your site, tells you about errors and warnings and problems that Google Webmaster Tools doesn't tell you about today. Uh, it tracks all your rankings for you. It tracks some key stats out of Google Analytics if you all opt in. Uh, it'll track some cool stuff about your link graph, who's pointing to you versus who's delinking to your competitors. It'll help you figure out why you're ranking number three and some other guy's ranking number two and what you can do to move up from there. But if you're not spending a bunch of time on SEO internally, it's probably not the right product for you. Like, it'd be a lot to spend. It's $99 a month. So for some people, a lot to spend. For small businesses, a lot to spend on something that you wouldn't use heavily. Uh, I, I would suggest no matter what you're doing, sign up for you know, Google Webmaster Tools, which is totally free. Use Open Site Explorer, which parts of that are totally free. There's and, some other and, cool free tools out Rand, there. But I want to ask you about Open Site Explorer because the real yeah. John Merch says, one of the things SEO Moz doesn't get credit for is Open Site Explorer. Mm -hmm. Everyone partners with you just for that. Any comment? Yeah, yeah so we have about I don't know, 30 or so paying API customers and probably another two or 300 people who use the API, the same API that powers Open Site Explorer that essentially exposes our link graph of the web. Um, that's been a very exciting business for us too. I think you know, there's people here at SEO Moz who are very bullish on that. Uh, I like the API business personally, but I like it more as a let's get our metrics out there, not let's monetize the hell out of it. Okay, now I'm gonna be the ultimate tease. Because before I do Panda, I need to talk about Fenwick & West. Fenwick & West is one of those authentic companies I can talk about because they were my lawyer. Fenwick & West is a law firm. It's nationwide. Uh, they have companies small and large. They work for some of the biggest names in Silicon Valley. But they also work for a tremendous amount of startups. Uh, Sam Angus, who's a good friend of mine who works there. Uh, and I don't just tart out Fenwick & West because I like Sam. Uh, Sam is the lawyer at Airbnb. Uh, if I could give him some street cred, um, I don't know. They were going to raise at a 20 million pre-money valuation, and he got them to a billion. No, just kidding. Um, but <laughs> but it, they are they understand how entrepreneurs work. And I tell this story from time to time. The way I met Sam is I was working with a really big Silicon Valley. Um, law firm that I didn't really get along all that well with. They didn't feel like they were very responsive to me. I went to a conference, and I know that you like conferences, Rand. And, uh, well, I do. <laughs> uh, uh, so I was at a conference, and Sam had sponsored it, and he didn't stand up and say, I'm a Fenwick and West, and we represent you know, HP and all these big companies, and you should work with us. Um, he stood up, and he just said, we sponsored this because we love working with startups. This event's about you, so I don't want to talk. But if anyone is looking uh, for legal services, you know I'm here. I'm happy to talk to anyone. And that was it. Like, it was very subtle. Um, and I sort of love that. And, you know, if I think about this concept that people talk about now, earned media, you know, for me, that was earned media because they held this classy event. We were all there at their behest. And, and yet they didn't do that awful seven-minute let me tell you about the law firm, uh, which I hate. Tell us about Panda. What is Panda, and why did it almost kill Mahalo? <laughs> um, OK, so basic story is there's a Google engineer. I forget his first name. His last name is actually Panda. Uh, he built a, and, and filed a patent, actually. Uh, he built a system to help Google scale machine learning to essentially Google quality standards so that it could be rolled out across what is uh, almost certainly one of the world's most impressive hardware systems. And this machine learning algorithm essentially takes the input of a bunch of Google quality raters, which are people distributed throughout the world who work for Google either on a full-time or contract basis, searching through Google search results and telling Google, this is good, this is spam, this is foreign characters, this doesn't make sense, this isn't. Uh, this is like adult content and isn't safe for people to see, and helping Google know whether they're doing a good job with writing their algorithms. And Google essentially took the input of their quality raters and then used a bunch of statistics that they haven't previously exposed or at least haven't talked about using as much in the past, including things like 
user and usage data, click-through rate, bounce rate, time on site, uh, browse rate on the site, click back to the SERPs, uh, you know, perform another search because I was unhappy with this. And they ask their quality raters questions like, would you trust this site with your credit card? Would you take medical information from your kids, uh, for your kids from this site? And then they tried to bias to show uh, sites that the quality raters liked and bias against sites the quality raters didn't like. The weird part about Panda is that it's not like, oh, now anchor text matters less in external links. It's now having a better user experience matters more. Having a better design matters more. Having happier users of your site matters more, which is great for everyone in the startup world who cares about having a great uh, user experience, but is kind of tough for businesses that in the past have relied on like classic SEO stuff so that, you know, I'm going to have a certain amount of good, unique content that's nowhere else on the web. I'm going to monetize that with ads. Those are the types of sites that quality raters tended not to like, and so the machine learning algorithm biased against. And why did it impact Mahalo? What's your internal thesis? Uh, you know, well, I mean, Mahalo, uh, since it was founded in 2007, sort of uh, was creating, you know, some content, you know, for some very high quality content, you know, some content that was not quite as high. Um, and I think some, some of the stuff that we had done on the lower end kind of caught up with us and stuff that was maybe monetizing at a better rate so suddenly lost some ranking, so we lost some money there. Um, and, that, you know, we, we were already planning to pivot towards what we're doing now, which is high, very high quality content, high quality video. Um, and that sort of just accelerated that pivot, um, but didn't really change our fundamental strategy in any way, just kind of moved us along a little bit faster. But that, that's sort of the Mahalo experience with it. Uh, yeah, one of the things you... that is weird about Panda... Um, that, that I'm sure Mike and, and, and Jason and all the folks over at Mahalo can appreciate is that it weirdly did not, like it, it, it's not a page-based algorithmic change, it's a domain-wide algorithmic change. So it's essentially saying not this page is something quality raters wouldn't like, but this site is something quality raters wouldn't like. So if you have 1,000 pages of awesome content and 5,000 pages of bad content, those 1,000 pages of good content might now ra be ranking lower because of the bad ones on your site. And that's a weird, new, different thing from Google. So we all know that video content is massively exploding on the internet. How does this affect SEO? Does SEO Moz take this into the consideration? What advice do you have for video? Where's all this heading with the video world? Yeah, I think the... I mean, the really exciting thing about video and search right now is a protocol that Google calls Video XML Sitemaps. So this is essentially where you can, uh, you can take video from YouTube, embed them on your pages, and send a Video XML Sitemap to Google, and Google will annotate your search results with that video, which means much higher click-through rate. Or sometimes they'll even put you in the video results, which means you don't have to rank or try and rank competitively against the top 10, you actually can rank uh, just in the video search results and, and win outsized returns from that. So it's, video is just awesome right now. Um, I highly recommend that people invest in it. But to Mike's point, it's gotta be high quality. So Rand, you, have you changed your brand? Are you still SEO Moz? Is there anything in the works? I don't want to ask a leading question because I might know more than I should. Yeah, yeah, you, you might know more than you should. Okay, so I won't go there. I won't go but there. Yes, so I mean, one thing that I will say about SEO Moz is that for a long time, like for the last decade, right, we've been focused on SEO. And I think that what's happened is that SEO has gotten bigger than SEO. Like uh, SEO is bigger than links and keywords and content and crawlability and this kind of stuff. Like. SEO is now social. SEO is now everything you talked about when you were talking about earned media goes into the SEO bucket. Everything that you do in organic marketing, uh, whether it's search, whether it's social, whether it's local or content or video or blogging or uh, uh, forums or RSS feeds, like all those things help every other one of those things. And that's one of the reasons that SEO Moz in our products, in our content are trying to get a bit broader because we recognize that a narrow focus on the classic SEO factors is a, doing a disservice to our customers. What have you learned? Because I think you probably do think a lot about, in general, what converts to your uh, website. Um, over the course of the last 18 months, 
all the discussion is about social conversion. What have yeah. you learned about social conversion? It sucks for first time visitors, but it is an awesome early point in the funnel. So for example, uh, if, if you can do, and we do a little bit of this, we don't do it as well as we want to eventually, but if you can look at life cycle attribution tracking, meaning uh, someone, searches, uh, someone searches for cheap flights to San Francisco and maybe they find uh, Hipmunk and then they're like, oh, interesting, Hipmunk's you know, kind of cool, I'll check them out. And then three days later, they're following a friend of theirs on Twitter and they see a tweet to Hipmunk and they're like, oh, I'll go back to the site. And then finally they decide that they're gonna book that flight and they go type in hipmunk.com. What gets credit? The only thing that gets credit is the direct type in. Right. And that sucks, like that, that life cycle attribution is critical. And when you see a life cycle attribution process, social is almost always somewhere in that funnel. Someone has mentioned your brand, someone has tweeted it, someone has Facebook status updated, <coughs> someone answered a question on Quora, someone posted about it on a blog or a forum. Like social is a huge so, part of how we get branded to go somewhere on the web and make an action, but it doesn't get the credit it deserves because that rarely is a transactional time. So this is another of the web's great secrets that a lot of people don't know and don't talk about it. We call it last mile attribution. And yeah. that is this, you look at Google, you look at how much search drives business, you look at the $23 billion that's spent there, but a lot of what drove you there was the banner ad. It may have even been a television commercial that you saw, and the way that you implement that Ford Focus that you saw on TV is you type Ford Focus into your search engine and it drives you to a car. Now there's a very clever company that plays in this space. I know the founder very well, Jeff Swelling. He's one of the smartest guys on the topic. It's called Convertro. Mm. Convertro, C-O-N-V-E-R-T-R-O, I believe. Maybe you could check for me. I hope I spelled that right. And he also keeps a blog where he writes about last mile attribution issues. And the reason Jeff knows so much about this is he ran a company called Y Lighting. He had to focus on how to drive traffic to their website to convert in the bottom end of the yeah. funnel. And he started realizing that they could run a campaign that would show spikes in search traffic. And they started playing with how do we do stuff more upstream to drive more search traffic and realize that there was a correlation between upstream activity and last mile attribution. This yeah. is the most clever company and most clever person I've come across that understands how to convert. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there's small hacky things that, that I would recommend startups do. If you uh, look, you can, you can uh, make some hacks in Google Analytics to get past last click attribution so you can see the first click that drove a visit that converted as well. But uh, Convertro and services like them are gonna, I think, have a great future because if you are doing web marketing, you're crazy not to be measuring the whole funnel. Subu4 asked a question that I was wondering, but I figured I was just being dense. You said social sucks for first time visitors. Why does it suck oh, no. for first time visitors? Uh, the other way around, it sucks for uh, a converting visit but it, it's awesome for those first time visits or getting people familiar with your brand or being somewhere in that life cycle. Okay, thank you. Uh, a number of people asked about MozCon and whether you're getting excited for MozCon and yeah. I'll, I'll just be the deductive guy here saying that must be like a conference you run or something. Tell us about MozCon. Yeah, so uh, we, we sort of, you know, we love what Salesforce does with Dreamforce. So every summer we have a uh, few hundred people out to Seattle, uh, have some really, really smart search and web marketers come and give talks. Should be very awesome. Uh, I am I am, I'm pretty excited about it. I think this year is gonna be like, just crazy. It, the, the passion for the, the SEO Moz brand is is still weird to me. It's, it's a fun thing to be a part of. And those are the uh, actual three days this summer where it doesn't rain in Seattle. The 27th to 29th is like summer, right? You just cursed us, man. Like, <laughs> now it is gonna pour. Yeah, uh, you know, when I was there recently, it was it was still, I guess it was spring, but almost summer, and uh, my close friend who's from Seattle promised me great weather, and it absolutely poured while I was there. It was yep. very typical. Yep. Um, so, 
you know, I guess I would ask you, what is the next big challenge for SEO Moz? What does the next year look like? Yeah, so you had asked me, you had asked me earlier about um, um, revenue, and I, I, I somehow forgot to share in the, in the question. But I'll give you, I'll give you a quick story, and then I'll tell you what I think the big challenge is because they're related. So, like 2007, we did 800,000 in revenue. 2008, we did 1.4. 2009, we did 4.1. 2010, we did 5.7, and this year we're going to do between 12 and 13. And I think the big challenge for us is going to be how do we keep up that. Uh, between two and three x growth rate that we've maintained the past four years, and how do we uh, build a product that adds more and more features that our customers want while making something simple and beautiful? Like that is, right? I mean, this is this is the big challenge that Google has, that Facebook has. Like customers want more stuff out of your product, but you need to keep it simple and elegant and beautiful for usability and user experience reasons. That's going to be insanely hard, but I, I have I have some faith that the team will get there. I don't know whether we'll get there in the first iteration, but but I think we can get there. A lot of people, Rand, wanting to know about your name. They're wondering if you dropped the Y because creditors were were chasing you, or was it always <laughs> Rand? No, no, no. This was the name I was born with. My um, my uncle's middle name was Rand, and uh, it's sort of a Jewish tradition that he he had died when he was young, and so when my when my dad and mom had me. Uh, I got his his middle name became my first name. Uh, as as a fellow uh, Jew, uh, that's how I named my son was after my grandfather when he passed away, Jacob. So yeah. uh, that's a tradition I know well. Uh, Sucking would like to know: uh, Are VCs pushing you to exit since you took money? Well, I mean, I guess yes, but not pushing us to. Exit too soon. I mean, for example, so uh, and I, I talked about this with you, Mark. But we had a, we had a what I thought was a very, uh, very nice acquisition offer earlier this year that we uh, turned down because we 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 think that we can do even more exciting things. And and the, our investors certainly were not pushing us to take that. Um, we are getting lots of this weird, you know, sort of inbound calls from investors now and. Saying like, oh, would you take more money? And is there, you know, thing, exciting things you can do? And to be fair, I think we are getting excited about the possibility of that, but also trying to be really cautious um, and not race into things. Gotcha. Well, uh, by Jess thinks Mahalo should buy you. Uh, I think you should buy Mahalo. So uh, <laughs> we'll work out a deal, uh, you, you and me, Mike. Well, I'm going to bring this show to a wrap. I want to thank some obvious people. Assistly, uh, if you have needs to manage customer service for your company, I can assure you, because I've played with the product a lot, it's a wonderful way to take multi-channel communications, consolidate it, and communicate back with your customers, delivering Zappos-like service to your end customers. Fenwick & West, uh, who's a longtime sponsor of the show, is a great law firm with a practice that focuses on startups. Ted Wang keeps a blog where he talks about interesting topics for you. Um, but of course, I want to thank both Mike Bracco for coming in uh, and sharing some stories with, about Mahalo and Rand Fishkin, the man, the myth, the conference horror, the man who's proved <laughs> every advice that I've ever given wrong. Uh, continued success to you. You as well, Mark. Great to join you. And Mike, good to meet you. Yeah, thank you.